There are many theories out there about what a church ought to be. Should it be just a skin for liturgical action? Should it be just a factory or an auditorium? Or is it something more? If you look in the great tradition, you'll see that churches are made of fine materials, they're assembled with a high level of craft, they're decorated with images of angels and saints and mosaic and marble and gold. The question is why? Now when you read the church's own documents on what she calls a Catholic church, you'll find out very quickly there's a deep theological understanding of the nature of the building. It comes from scripture and its fundamental reality, in addition to its practical function as a place of worship, is that it's an image or a sacrament with a small s of the glorified mystical body of Christ. Now Catholics might think of the Eucharist as the sacramental presence of the mystical body of Christ and that is absolutely true. You can also say the priest is an image of Christ for the world. You can say the cantor sings the voice of Christ to the Father. You can say the lector at Mass is letting the word of Christ be known in the world. But then you can also extend this out even further to say, how would Christ be known if he were a building? Because scripture speaks of his body as the temple. And so what does it mean for Christ's body to be a building? And here's the basic logic. Christ has a body that's made of many members, his head, his hands, his eyes, his feet, his legs. But he's also taken all creation on himself. So Christ has taken all of creation, that would be the stars, the leaves, the trees, the angels, the saints, and us, and brought it back to the Father. So the image of his body is a little bit wider than most people might think. Then you say, okay, Christ has gone back to the Father at the ascension, and he's left the church as his continuing mission in the world. And how is the church assembled? And you see this in the New Testament. It's made of many members. It's under the headship of Christ, in this case, Peter, the successors of Peter as the Pope, then bishops and pastors, and even to the heads of families. There's a hierarchical ordering of many members, and the church is composed of these members. Well then, take the step even one step further, and you can say, ah, well, the church building is now an image of the church. The church is an image of Christ, Christ contains all of heaven and all of earth in this microcosm of all creation. So when we look at the order of the dedication of the church, the church's own book for how she wants churches to be built, she begins by opening with the description of the church itself. That the church building is a special image of the church, that's the people of God with Christ, which is God's temple built from living stones. So members of the church, living human beings, and the angels and the saints are the living stones of the church, the perfect worshiping members of the body of Christ offering perfect worship to the Father. The rite continues, the faithful should be reminded that the structure to be built of stone will be a visible sign of the living church, God's building which they themselves constitute. It's the household of God and the Spirit. We're adopted into God's family, made possible by the Holy Spirit in baptism. And then, especially it says the Holy Temple. Now what's a temple? A temple is a small microcosm of all of heaven and earth. In other words, the giant nature of the cosmos, stars, angels, saints, buds, leaves, flowers, heaven, is brought to a small version inside a little building. And so to go in the church is to leave space and time and to enter into some small vision of the entire cosmos, which of course is what Christ is. It's infinity shrunk into infancy, the whole of creation, entered into Mary's womb in the incarnation of Christ. And since the church is the continuing action of Christ in the world, and the church building signifies that, to go in a church is to see all of creation brought to glory. Now the comparison, or the equation of Christ's body with the temple, comes right out of scripture. In John chapter two, the apostles are looking at these fascinating, glistening stones of the temple of Jerusalem, and Christ says, tear down this temple, and in three days I will build it up. And then the scripture says he was speaking of the temple of his body. So how is a building like Christ's body? And how is Christ's body like the church? And how is the church like a church building? Well, here you go. Christ's body is made of many members perfectly assembled, just as the temple building in Jerusalem was made of many stones perfectly assembled. Christ goes back to the Father, but he leaves the church on earth to be this continuing action in the world where he still blesses and forgives sins and glorifies and heals. So what is the church made of? Many different members, perfectly assembled, through which the radiance of Christ's presence is known in the world. What is a church building? Composed of many members, bricks, stones, tiles, roof tiles, gold, steel, stained glass, and 
what comes through it? The radiance of Christ's light and presence in the world. So according to the liturgical books of the church, the church is a tangible, material sign of Christ. And therefore, the decisions of its architect should be that it makes that theological reality knowable. It's the image of the glorified mystical body of Christ, and it's at once, it says, the house of God, the place where God dwells, and also the house of the people of God. So we don't need to split those up to say, well, the people don't matter, and therefore the church building is everything, or to say, the people are everything, and the church building doesn't matter. What we want to say is, the people of God and the building that signifies them brought to glory are what they call mutually constitutive. Together, they make either one of them more than they would be, and the parts together are more than they would be alone. When you read the section on the dedication of a church itself, it says the building is a special sign of the pilgrim church on earth, right? The many members who are all assembled there, and the image of the church dwelling in heaven. Why is that? Because the saints and the angels are also members of Christ's mystical body. So a church building can do something that a gathering of people cannot do. It includes the people, but then adds to them the visions of heaven, the persons of the Trinity, the angels, the saints, even the new earth as it's joined to the new heaven, so that nature and all of creation is shown in its heavenly glory. And you see this very often in the great basilicas in Rome, where Christ is on the throne, but he's surrounded by the rainbow, angels, saints, garden images, water, rivers, trees, flowers, deer drinking from running streams. Here's the great cosmic vision that we are meant to see that comes right out of the book of Revelation. This is the vision that John sees. I see one on the throne surrounded by the rainbow emerald, the white-robed elders, and what are they singing? Holy, holy, holy. So just as the people in the pews are singing holy, 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 so the heavenly component of the mystical body of Christ is singing holy, holy, holy as well. And we not only get to hear them when we sing it, we get to see them when we have a great mural or a great mosaic program that shows those same heavenly beings that are doing the same thing that we're doing, praising and worshiping God in unity by the Holy Spirit brought into our priestly dignity to offer worship to God. Now, interestingly, the universal prayer, the prayer of the faithful at the dedication of a church, asks God to gather his scattered children in an echoing of the great gathering of the tribes of Israel. Remember, Christ had to gather the tribes. Think about all the stones and or bricks or tiles that are scattered around a building site, and one by one they are assembled by the workers to form this great image of the church building. So you see the many members properly assembled has this great microcosmic vision of Christ's salvific mission. The scattered children of Israel are like the uncut stones waiting to be hewn and dressed by God's hand, as the prayer says. In other words, just like each of us is slowly brought to the perfection that God wants us to have, so a brick, a stone, a piece of lumber that's cut by the builder and assembled according to the plans of a great architect is bringing each individual piece to its perfection, just as God brings each member of the mystical body, that is us, to their particular perfection. Our nature is transformed by grace. The building of a church requires things of the earth that are brought to a higher level of existence and then assembled into the image of the mystical body of Christ as it would be rendered in art and architecture. The prayer for dedication of a church continues with wonderful texts. It says, here is foreshadowed the mystery of the true temple. That's Christ, of course. Here is prefigured the image of the heavenly Jerusalem. Heavenly Jerusalem is the biblical code for the word heaven itself. When heaven and earth are united, the end of time in the book of Revelation, you find out what's there. Heavenly glory, earthly glory, and it's called the wedding feast of the Lamb. So God and humanity, who from the time of the fall of Adam and Eve had been somewhat separated from each other, are now brought together as one. And so the church building is also the wedding banquet of the eternal feast, celebrating Christ's redemptive power. And what's a wedding? It's festive, it's joyful, it's radiant, it's delightful with excess, in a sense. It's celebratory food and drink and decoration. So a church building is a great wedding hall between heaven and earth. Anything you can say about your wedding, you should be able to say about your church. Joyfully elevated, decorated, and rich to mark the fact that God is celebrating our return to his fatherly heart. And lastly, the book of Revelation speaks of heaven being made of gems. 
and each one of these gems has on it the name of one of the apostles. This is a fulfillment of the Old Testament, where the high priest wore a breastplate with 12 gems, each inscribed with the names of one of the 12 tribes of Israel. So as back as early as the second book of the Bible, you have gems that are stones brought to glory. Then the temple is made of stones. Then Paul says, you are living stones in the temple of God. And then heaven is made of stones now, but they're gems. Rubies, sapphires, diamonds, emeralds. So what does it mean? A regular plain rock has become a glorified building block of the heavenly Jerusalem. A diamond, a sapphire, an emerald, a ruby. Just like your soul and mine, someday will be glorified, living with the light of Christ as we are brought into the divinization that is to be made like God. And what is heaven? The assembling of the many who are made like God celebrating joyfully with the light of Christ and singing the praise of God forever. Think about that the next time you look at the bricks in the wall of a church. Hey, that's Pius X, that's Aunt Martha, that's Uncle Harry, brought to glory now around the throne of God. So what we know then is a church is more than a meeting house. It's more than a factory for living in. It's an emblem of God's love who says, I want you to learn to be heavenly even now on earth, to do heavenly things, to sing heavenly words, and to look at the beauty of heaven even now, while you wait for the time to come when you too will be able to celebrate with the angels and the saints in perfect joy.